I'm not going to put me telling the audience to sod off in the edit. <laughs> I may be an aloof engineer, but I'm not an arsehole. Well, I don't think I'm an arsehole. Maybe I am. <laughs> we've, we've done that joke already. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, we haven't done it with me yet, and I'm just better. <laughs> also, that's the guy that suggested a title that is literally referencing an old title. I don't think you get to complain about repeats. Look, Not that I disagree with your title suggestion. There is no other title choice for this episode. There really isn't. <laughs> I, I have to ask the question to start. Best episode of the reboot, I think, is a given. Is this the best episode ever? <sighs> I mean, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> um, from what I can remember, this is like the most into an episode of Robot Wars I've ever been. So uh, for, for me, at least my memory of, of Robot Wars, this is the best one I've seen, but... Uh, Mr. Mr. Expert in all things Robot Wars, what do you think? <laughs> I've given this more thought than I'm comfortable having given it. I think Series 5, which was won by Razor, was an absolutely excellent grand final, but it only really stands out because of one of the semi-finals, which was Bigger Brother versus Hypnodisc, where Hypnodisc absolutely smashed Bigger Brother and Bigger Brother came back in the last few seconds to win it. And of course, they then went into the grand final a complete wreck and had no chance. There were really good fights in that, but the actual final itself was a complete formality. I certainly don't think we've ever had such a varied final lineup. Not certainly since maybe the first series, which seems like a silly thing to say. But they were linked only at the, in that they were all terrible. <laughs> if I really dug deep... I think I could find an episode that maybe comes close, but I'd be surprised if I found anything better than this. The quality of fight was off the charts. Every fight, every fight was spectacular to watch in its own way. The whole episode, like glued to the television, Hannah and I both cheering and, and stuff. It was, yeah, it was, it was an excellent episode. We found a lot to complain about this series, and I think we've done that fairly. I don't think we've been out to criticise, it's just what has come up. This episode, even the fluff that we had, I liked. It was good fluff. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... I, I I can tell you're about to disagree. No, I don't, I don't disagree. I, I, I don't feel strongly about the fluff one way or the other. I think, I think the best I can say about it is I didn't really notice it, which I think is, 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 what, which is what we want. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. That's the target, really, isn't it? <laughs> one thing it really got me thinking about well, one thing that I thought at the time that I realised was completely wrong was that in my head I was going, wow, this is a great final because it went to a judge's decision. And then I realised that actually a surprising number of finals have gone to judges' decisions. So Series 3 Grand Final, Chaos versus Pussycat. Sorry, Chaos 2 versus Pussycat. Series 6, The Awful Tornado versus Razor Fight. Series 7, The Producers vs. Storm 2. <laughs> series 8, and now this. Which I suppose is how it should be, isn't it? You should have two robots that can last three minutes in a grand final. Yeah, I think what I think what stood out to me is that this was a judging decision that I couldn't immediately sort of call. When, I, when it got to the end, I was like, I don't know who's going to win. I have no idea. And if either way, I think I'd be, I'd, I'd be okay with it. You know, like I, there wasn't feeling like... Oh, th this one robot should win, but I think the judge is going to give it the other way, or or this one should clearly win, so the judge's decision is a bit is a formality and pointless. You know, this was really close, really hard to call, and I think, and I think both robots deserved the win. Mm. My immediate reaction was, I can't call this, followed immediately by eruption will win it, <laughs> because the trend seems to be. The, the moment you last three minutes against a working spinner, you have won the fight. Gabriel would be the exception to that, but because good anti-spinner strategy is very aggressive, any robot that makes it all the way is probably going to win on aggression. If you win aggression, you win everything. And that was how it turned out to be. And quite a lot of people, I think, dislike that as a set of rules, but to me, it makes complete sense. Because any spinner that doesn't get a knockout in three minutes has not done what it was intending to do. So the moment you last that long, you're pretty much there. A, 
I mean, we're getting way out of order here, but I don't even care. <laughs> the driving from Michael in that match was unreal. I, I told We've you. Said I told so you. I said. Before. I said if Michael wins, it's because he outdrives Carbide. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I'd started kind of losing faith in his driving. I think this series, but the little details of what he was doing, the way that he seemed to be going in against Carbide and then just turning to the right at the last second to make sure that, that impact came on the front of his robot rather than the side, consistently doing that. And then adapting that for when it was upside down, of course, as well. Absolutely beautiful work. It was all that. And obviously, you know, the, the, the judges and Jonathan Pierce were going, oh, does, does the eruption's flipper work? Is it broken? And I'm sat there going, he's just not using it. Like, it clearly still works. He's just not using it. And then, of course, then obviously, it still worked. He was just waiting for the, for the, for the opportune moments to, uh, to use it. Almost exactly as he did in the 10 way. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most wedgy I've ever seen Michael try to be with eruption. Yeah, well, when you're in a fight that's got no time limit, every flip counts. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I stupidly allowed myself to forget when we were talking about this last episode is that Michael is possibly the only Roboteer in that 10-way that has done those kind of fights a few times before because he's done them with the featherweights with Explosion. So he knows what the strategy is in there. He knows what the dangers are. And everyone else has treated it like a slightly larger melee when it's really not. Mm, this is interesting because it's like if everyone did what Michael did, <laughs> it would be a really boring fight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you know Michael's tactic worked and it worked for television because there's so much else going on um, and because everyone else is doing the more entertaining option. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> and that is generally the criticism you will hear of Michael and Eruption. This idea of, oh, he's ruthlessly tactical and it's not entertaining. But tell me that seeing him in that final against Carbide wasn't entertaining. That was such an amazing thing to have happened. And to, to go from, yeah, to, to sort of get to the final through the 10 way is just mad. It's such a great story. Um, to to have told and 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 it is very entertaining. And the other thing I'll say about tactical driving and how entertaining it is, um, it's one of those things where if everyone did it, it would be boring. I agree. If everyone took it as seriously as Michael does, and if everyone went with with all the, that kind of strategy, it would be boring. It wouldn't be good television at all. Um, but not everyone does. Most people do it in a in a different way, and 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 it is entertaining having that that variation in people's approaches and what they do makes it entertaining. And having Michael being there, the strategist and stuff, is is worth worthwhile. Mm. And of course, there are designs in that fight where that strategy wouldn't necessarily be useful. So if you're sat there driving Sabretooth or Concussion, you want to get in there. You want to cause some chaos with your weapon. No, no, no. Clearly the option there is sit in the corner, spinning your drum and, not, uh, and, and, and using all your battery without doing any damage. That's, <laughs> that's what you want to do, right? <laughs> Just spin up menacingly and back away. Yeah, get get the death drum Although, going. Slight point of order: having your drum going at full speed isn't what drains battery; it's getting it there. But yeah, that's true. That's by the by. Do any um do any drum spinners use um equivalent of curves? Do they do they re try and recharge their battery, slowing their drum down again? When are you trying to slow your drum down? Except at the end of a fight. Yeah, this is true. I don't know. I wonder if 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 like sometimes because Ellis didn't have his drum going all the time in this and uh I, i'm not sure he had a choice and it's the yeah it's, it's, it, what, what was it that he he it wasn't working properly or, or or was it that he was spinning it down for the sake of maneuverability at certain times and stuff i don't know i can i can, I can see a situation where if you've got a robot that that, that gyro dances a lot i can see a situation where you'd want to stop your weapon quickly um to to, to move around and then be able to start it up again quickly. We'll save that because I have a point to make on that that is very specifically tied to a certain fight. Okay. <laughs> so I'll have to leave you in suspense if that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I know that you hate doing this. I know that this kills you, but I'm going to have to because it's it, it's a solid point, you know? The thing is what often happens is we say this at the beginning and then when I'm editing, I realise that whatever it was we hinted at at the beginning never came up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll have to rely on me to be better than that then. <laughs> the other thing, of course, with the 10-way and the tactical driving is that you will also have teams in there that just don't care. 
And by far the best example of that was the traction team, who had very clearly made the... I was going to say tactical decision. It's the anti-tactical decision to just charge in anyway and see what happened. Yeah. <laughs> it was very much death or glory. And the answer was death. Death and glory, I think. Actually, yeah. <laughs> I think oh, man, what... if, we didn't, if we didn't already have a title, that would be a great one. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was all right. I'm sort of... I'm, 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 I'm glad that they got stuck in and i'm glad they got pitted quite quickly because <laughs> i would have hated to have seen that robot get destroyed <laughs> yeah they got taken out in about the most precise way possible didn't they yeah it's just like remove remove a track and then eventually get pushed into the pit at some point and 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 that's that the other interesting thing for me is that the robots that did well were largely the live scene competitors i don't know if that's just luck I don't know if that's a result of having had a lot more driving practice. I don't know if that's a result of having a lot more fights under your belt to improve the reliability of a robot. But if you look at a robot like Thor, for example, that made it through or the, or as far as it did without its weapon. It just drove incredibly well. Terahertz as well. The weapon wasn't particularly effective, but driven very well. Apollo as well didn't do a great deal, but driven very well. Iron Ore managed to not get flipped for about two minutes. <laughs> Iron Ore, the potential series winner that never worked. <laughs> as we know, I, re I rate potential over anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it never worked. <laughs> Which is exactly why I feel like I get a buy on this. You, no, you get no buy. You you get mocked, my friend, for backing the worst robot. <laughs> Put it this way. I, I've started work on a robot rundown. It's not really complete, but suffice to say, they are at the bottom of one of the lists. <laughs> Damn like, straight. genuinely rock bottom. <laughs> Where they belong. Pretty much, yeah. But what they did do was make very good use of the pit release button during that melee they made use of it three times in fact oh did they hit six? <laughs> yeah. because as was made very clear there are no rules there are no rules there are no rules that's true i'd, I'd, I'd say there is one rule the, the one rule i have is that uh, the fog of war is stupid every time it happens oh not only did we have it twice in about 30 seconds it was iron ore that set it off both times we had it three times total in at, at least three times in this uh in this melee in this 10 way and yeah it just just sucks it's just awful it's just awful i think the the, the conclusion is clear <laughs> you know we've had the data we've seen the whole series fog of war is stupid they need to get rid of it it's just awful nothing about it is good i will be amazed if we see it again absolutely amazed because the way it's been treated in commentary they haven't exactly been trying to back it, have they? No. I mean, there'd be one positive thing, I think, maybe for you, if if uh, if they do bring it back again, which is that we'll probably get an hour and a half of me complaining about it. <laughs> which may or may not be good. I don't know. It depends how entertaining you find that. <laughs> I think you could put together an excellent rant. <laughs> but there's one other piece of shenanigans that I have to question. What house robots are in the arena for that fight there's kill a lot there's shunt and is matilda in there as well nope no and is dead metal in there or not then yes and no dead metal did not start off in that arena dead metal has arrived some point in the middle and i don't know how was it like under the cover of fog of war it was parachuted in or have they actually taken the we have to match it's a fairly hefty risk of opening one of those side panels to let it in and then closing it again. No, they wouldn't have done that. Um, there's well, well, surely they didn't stop the fight to bring it in. Well, you see, you say that, but there was, there was. I can't remember if it was in this fight or a later one, but there was an interest. There was a cut that looked a bit odd to me at some point, um, and I can't remember if it was in this fight or another one. I didn't actually, I didn't actually note it because I didn't, I didn't think it would ever come up in conversation, so I didn't bother writing it down. Um, I don't know. I don't know where it would have come. And maybe they did sort of pause it quickly just to because they felt like we need to have more robots in there. Did it? Did it come in toward the end? I only noticed it in the final minute or so. I think, but it may have been in there sooner. I imagine what they did was had it parked at one of the sides, shot around it, and then at some point, presumably with the roboteers knowing it was going to happen, so they didn't accidentally drive out of the arena. 
opened one of the sides to let it in just to basically keep the chaos up. Because obviously when you've gone from 10 robots down to about four, what would normally look like a very full arena is going to look a bit empty. So I imagine they did that. I completely appreciate them doing that as well because that was kind of the point of this fight. But it was just weird that they didn't draw attention to it. Although that's... Oh, oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. I just had a flashback. Oh, no. The American series did a sort of House Robot Rebellion style episode where some contestants went up against the House Robots and partway through they did a sort of record scratch freeze frame bring in Sir Killer Lot with smoke and rousing music and it was possibly the worst thing that's ever happened on TV. <laughs> and I'm basically sat here asking for them to do that again and I'm ashamed of myself because yeah. that that was awful. Your idea is bad and you should feel bad. I, I feel more than bad. <laughs> I'm very disappointed with myself. <laughs> there are some other shenanigans in this involving Sir Killalot. Oh that, yes, that I found entertaining. That's not right. So that's, well, not, that's right. not so that that's one. But the, the the one I want to go quickly touch on first is that Killalot frees itself from the uh, from <laughs> from the corner patrol zone at some point because he 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 pushes eruption into the Dial of Doom, which triggers a uh, a roadhouse <laughs> robot. <laughs> No, no, no. He pushes eruption into the vicinity oh, I'm sorry, yes. of the Dial of Doom. <laughs> yes. Let's not let, let, let's not overstate this. <laughs> yes, he he causes he, he wins he uh, wins eruption there near the near the Dial of Doom, causing causing eruption to exhale slightly, which triggers the Dial of Doom and releases Killalot, <laughs> which which Hannah and I both found very amusing. Um, but yeah, the, the the other shenanigans there is is Killalot trying to put terahertz out of the arena. What do you uh, what do you think of that? I think there are no rules. I'm entirely with John on this. Like I was like and he was putting it very politely saying that's not right. <laughs> not not quite the words I was using. I think had it managed it, it would have been an issue. <laughs> I think ha well, there's two sides to this. It was Rogue House Robot that started it. So had Killer Lot managed it within the 10 seconds, that's fair game. After the 10 seconds, not so sure of the the morals of this, let's say. <laughs> I think had Killalot managed it under any circumstances, I would have been very unhappy. <laughs> I mean, if it happened within the bounds of Rogue House Robot, would it be any different to Matilda one-hit KOing a robot with her flywheel? I think it would actually, because I think I think doing that with Kill a Lot requires a lot more intent than one hit hitting someone with Matilda. Like when you've got a kinetic energy weapon, you depending on how you hit it, you might just sort of knock it across the arena a bit, or you might cause it to vent all its CO two, or you might completely knock it out. Um, there's a sort of a bit of a game of chance there. Whereas with Kill a Lot, that's that requires a lot of intent from the driver of Kill a Lot to 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 put them out of the pit, and that's a really intentionally definitive like match ending thing to have happened yeah but when your brief is to do as much damage as possible in 10 seconds putting a robot out is about as much damage as you can do yeah, but that's in not competitive terms that's not damage oh yeah but that's you know that's not damage though is it so would you have been okay if kill a lot just chopped the axe head off then because that's <laughs> damage i would have i think i would have been more okay with it weirdly i mean i'd still be sad <laughs> it would have been hilarious to watch that thing just flip around as well without the weight on it yeah I mean, yeah, I mean, Killer Lot's beheaded people before. It would have gone very Blacksmith Minosaur at that point, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it would. Just hit it with a stick. <laughs> the final question I have with the rumble, as it were, what actually happened to Big Nipper? They were re they flew under the radar better than Eruption did. And then suddenly they just weren't there anymore and they were in the pit and I don't quite know what happened. I think they went in the pit at some point during a rogue house robot. Something. There, there, there was action happening elsewhere and I think like many other teams, I think they just went in the pit at some point by accident, like slightly poor driving or got pushed in by someone else or something and it was just happened at the same time as something more exciting was going on. So that's where the cameras were pointed. I would be very, very happy if the BBC released a single uncut overhead shot of that whole fight i doubt it'll happen <laughs> but that would be great because I, I could watch that quite a many times i'd be surprised if such a shot even existed let alone the bbc releasing it 
<laughs> if they didn't think of that and they do it again, please, BBC, just just set up that camera shot. I don't care how much work it is. Give us an actual overview of exactly what went on there. <laughs> Surely not much work. Just grab a GoPro and stick it in a corner somewhere. But no, I, I was thinking, like, put it on the ceiling, pointing down, centre mass. They've got the rigging for it, because they've got that camera that starts above the, the, the arena at the beginning of every fight that does the, the weird sort of, like, panning around stuff. Like, so they've got the rigging for a camera that's on cables and stuff up there so they you know they could have done it i just i'd just be surprised if they bothered to film it like that what if they bothered to get the best possible angle of the action <laughs> yep i would be surprised well <laughs> anything else to say about the rumble I, I know there is so much more to say it's just being able to say it all at once isn't it i mean so Sabretooth's drum is working yes as we as we hoped it would be and they uh, and they Gabe's and they, driving isn't working though. Well, they they do all right for a while. Um, so they they, they do damage. Like they they've taken they they're the ones responsible for taking some of the panels off of Apollo. They also grind away a bit of eruption at some point, and then they drive into the pit. You know what I absolutely loved about this thing? The way that every team when they were out just took those respectful steps back. I think they were told to. <laughs> oh yeah, they they were almost certainly told to. But it was a great visual of sort of. Here are the people that are still left standing. Here are the people in shame. <laughs> Stand at the back of the room. Hang your heads in shame. <laughs> the other thing as well, actually, something that I forgot to mention. Interesting tactics from expulsion, opting for camouflage. Yeah, I wouldn't have known this had I not seen it on Twitter that they did that. <laughs> I wouldn't have I wouldn't have noticed because they went into the pit so fast. When the preview came on in the last episode, it took me a while to find them. <laughs> And now it makes sense why. Yeah. I do wonder if, had they had an ounce of driving ability to stay away from the pit, I wonder whether that would have helped them fly under the radar if they'd chosen to. I, I wonder if they drove into the pit because they didn't know where their own robot was. <laughs> also a possibility. <laughs> I mean, I, I bet it's hard enough to track what's going on as it is without, without making your robot hard to see. What they need is some kind of special glasses and a special light on the robot. <laughs> that shines a light only visible through those glasses <laughs> because that is clearly the most important part of robot design how would that problem is you like you'd have to do something that's actually it'd be easier to make everyone else wear glasses that filter that wavelength of light out we'll do that <laughs> instead it's a far more practical approach it just requires a little social engineering <laughs> yeah, have these have these 3d glasses they'll make the fight much more much more uh engaging <laughs> It'll be like you're really there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to move on to some melees, don't you? <laughs> if you insist. This first melee is very much carbide as a pantomime villain with the two absolute crowd favourites against it. So they've got like the usual format here of let's sort of introduce the robots, bit of VT stuff. Um, Dave from Carbide is at the beginning quoted along the lines of he thinks he's one of the best drivers he thinks that's been proven that no one can outdrive us <laughs> which made me laugh i think it's easy to underestimate the difficulty of driving a robot like carbide but at the same time <laughs> it's not the hardest thing out there to drive keep the weapon pointing at the opponent there are nuances beyond that that you can employ or master to be more effective. But the base level of driving a robot like that surely has to be easier than the base level of, say, driving a flipper. Yeah, if you've got a weapon like that in the arena, you just like you just need to you could you could sit in the middle and just keep it pointed at them, and if they're foolish enough to come towards you, they're gonna take a lot of damage. <laughs> I don't think Carbide... Although we could make that argument against nuts at this point as well. Not that they're claiming to be great drivers. Although the minibot drivers are exceptional. Absolutely astonishing. But you know, this that's the difference there is that nuts aren't claiming to be one of the best drivers at all. <laughs> it's just it's only because they said that. It's just sort of like you know, if you say something like that that I disagree with, you're gonna get I'm gonna call you out on it. <laughs> just like Dave will punish people that use entanglement. Yes, just like that. <laughs> Can I point out at this point as well, remember that whole the team captains are the only people in the team thing that was going on for the first few episodes. <laughs> Goodbye yes. to that. Yeah. No more, no more Sam. 
not that we don't love Dave. Dave's a very charismatic man. He gives great sound bites. But <laughs> come on, BBC, a little consistency here. <laughs> They're as consistent as you are. Behemoth, meanwhile, is still only Ant, of course. Yep. They're, they're, they're really hoping for another walkout there, aren't they? <laughs> I, I can imagine producers just trying to rile him up over the day, like knocking his lunch out of his hand <laughs> or spilling water all over him as they walk past. <laughs> just poking him with a sharp stick. Maybe the uh, maybe the pitting action there was actually like an intentional thing from the producers, and they just CG'd in one of the little bots to, so that we wouldn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> that did give rise to one of my favourite moments of the episode, which was Ant's reaction to that. Where first of all he's what on earth went on, and then he's told you sort of ah oh, dang it, <laughs> which is the most beautifully mild reaction to what has happened. <laughs> I think there's I think there's a mixture of, uh, of of anger and relief. You're sort of like, oh, that's a rubbish way to go out, but also relief that he's not going to have his robot completely obliterated by carbide. You also can't help feeling that they're so happy just to be in the final, they probably don't care that much what happens from here on in. You know, it isn't going to be devastating to come sixth. Oh, obviously you want to do better, but it wouldn't be devastating. Is it like going out in the first round? No, not not quite that bad. This I just also just I've just seen my note for this. The uh, the the intro the intro man that's sort of doing the names in the in the in the silly voice. The the breaths were included in Bear Moth, so it was like <gasps> Bear Moth. <laughs> Flipper, like it was really, yeah. You, you, go, go watch it again. There's a really like obvious intake of breath at the beginning. I can't quite get the sound that he does when he's breathing in, but it's it's quite funny. <laughs> if there's anyone I can rely upon to notice breath and mouth sounds, it is you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. No, that that's an absolutely fantastic observation. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't notice. I can't believe I didn't either. I think I was too busy for the first few episodes of this series. I've made notes as I've watched. The last two episodes, I've just been texting back and forth with a friend of mine. And I think I've enjoyed the episodes a bit more because of that. But it does mean I miss these things, you know? Yeah, I've, I've, I sort of, I started watching a bit less critically towards the end. So that I would still enjoy them and I'm glad I did. But this, this stood out. It's just one of those sounds that I noticed very quickly. <gasps> Flipper! <laughs> <laughs> Spinner! <laughs> I don't know where that voice came from. I was so focused on the breath. Yeah, it's, oh, it's silly. <laughs> you, should go, you should go find it. And of course, we now we now have to turn our attentions to not to... The heroes of this episode. <laughs> oh, the, the heroes of robot combat in general. <laughs> it's just so... Ast- everything, everything that they did was so astonishing. Now, the key point of their heat with Nuts was, oh, that was a lucky hit, and that was a lucky hit, and oh, that was also a lucky hit. How many times do they have to hit critical components of opponents before it stops being a lucky hit? I mean, they got if it's still lucky hits, they got a lot in this episode because they they de-chained Carbine on their first hit pretty much against Carbine at the perfect height. And then you can see in the slow-mo later on when they face each other again, you can see that those flails, had, not, had uh, Carbine not put the nuts guard on, they would still they would lose their chain again. They would it's would they would so consistently lose that fight. Not, not the fight, but they'd lose they'd lose their weapon early on every time. It yeah. gets nuts. Their first contact with Carbide breaks the chain. Their second contact probably would have if the first hadn't. And the third also would have a gain because it goes literally inside the weapon mounting. Yeah, and at that point they've stopped the weapon as well. They've they've taken the drive out of it and then they've taken all the energy out of it as well. There's not even any momentum left to take to do any damage to them anymore. Yeah. So good. Absolutely. I really hope that we remembered to say that we thought this would happen in the last episode. <laughs> I'm really worried that I thought it and didn't get around to saying it. And now don't look like the clairvoyant genius that we all know I am. Because I'm the only person that called it. We both definitely mentioned that Nuts was gonna could potentially be a carbide killer. I think we said it would be a lucky hit to hit that chain, but um, I think we were pandering yeah. at that point. <laughs> but they, uh, they, they hit that chain, and yeah, they would, they would, they were going to hit it. <laughs> no, no doubt about it anymore. But of course, taking that chain out doesn't win them the fight. The mini bot driving wins them the fight. Oh my goodness me! I've never seen mini bots be more effective than than when nuts are using them. It's just astonishing. And I think the one fight where the mini bots don't drive well 
which is the second carbide fight, you see how necessary they are. Yeah. So, what do the mini bots do in this one? So they the the, the mini bots fire the uh, fire the button, which pits pits Bam off, and then the mini bots just do an amazing job of of getting in the way of carbide. You sort of think that a robot that small shouldn't be able to stop carbide from moving, but they just they do. They 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 get under carbide and lift the wheels up. They I think they pin it at some point, and or maybe yeah they pin it at some point and uh, and. And just constantly get in the way. So, you know, Carbide can't get a run up to even like full body hammer uh, against nuts. It's just they 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 just do such an amazing job of, 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 of giving nuts to the space it needs to spin those flails up. And then it's just it's just a battle of attrition. I think this is the, the world's greatest bashy bashy fight. This is because it's sort of it's that kind of no one's doing massive damage to each other. It's a bit of a thing of attrition. But with those two mini bots, Nuts Two has the advantage, and and you know takes chunks out of the tires. Carbide can't drive because its tires are messed up. It can't drive because the mini bots are in the way, and it's oh, such a good fight. It's interesting that you say you didn't realise that mini bots could pin a heavyweight that well, but you've seen a door stop before. Yes, you know yeah, it, makes, it, it makes it, complete it, sense. That literally is what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's get under, let the weight of them push you down so you don't move. And get their wheels off the ground. That's basically all there is to it. The hard part is getting there in the first place, and they do a fantastic job of that. We also get that amazing shot of the minibot chasing Carbide around. That's <laughs> so good. <laughs> so good. It's such a ridiculous sight as well. <laughs> the thing that still annoys me is that the presenters continue to look at nuts as a joke bot that came good. I don't think Nuts 2 has ever been a joke bot. Nuts 1, maybe. Nuts 2 always had this potential. It just happened to not work last time. To me, the joke was over a while ago. Granted, they seem surprised by its success, but I think that's just natural humility rather than we weren't even trying to do this. Because no one... No one enters a robot that they think is completely uncompetitive. <laughs> is that so? They might enter a robot where they have reasonably low expectations, but those expectations won't be to lose. Those expectations will be, let's try and win a fight. And even they are few and far between this series because it's a smaller field. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think it's the job of the presenters to to entertain and to and to sort of take the audience through it. So it doesn't surprise me at all that they're going to keep that nuts two as a bit of a joke robot that's suddenly suddenly amazing or unexpectedly amazing. I think for the, for the majority of the audience that is the that is the perception, um, partly because of how the robot looks and works, and I also think partly because of the way it's, it's edited and presented. But you know that's that's. That's what's going to happen, I think, when you have a robot that's so different to everyone else. Is is of course you're going to, you know, w w when you break that far away from the meta and then do well, of course the story that everyone's going to pedal for it is is one of sort of surprise and isn't this amazing and wasn't that isn't it so in ridiculous that this you know joke in scare quotes robot has has done well. See, even then, I don't see the robot as a joke. The fact it's different doesn't automatically make it a joke. No, I don't think it does at all. But that's the easier thing to do for television, isn't it? Yeah, but even though I think it's grossly unfair, the team themselves, they sort of intentionally bring almost a novelty value in terms of outfits and things like that. But I worry that their sportsmanship makes them more likely to be put across as a joke as well because they're not being hyper-competitive. When actually that's just the way it should be. You should be willing to lose and lose gracefully. Which, to be fair, I'm, I'm gonna, I feel I need to say this. I think almost every team is like that. I think there are very few teams that you see get bitter at all about a loss. And when they do, it's usually due to disappointment in themselves. The Nuts team just go to a next level of sportsmanship, like the Deosaur team always did. Which is a very natural comparison to make, mainly because of the fur. <laughs> yeah, the fur, the joke robot that occasionally does well as well, you know, it's sort of... And I will say, Deotor was a joke robot. Because Deotor was basically designed to go in and catch fire and for that to look good. Over time, I think they realised that they might as well also be slightly competitive and managed to beat one good robot, basically, in Tornado. <laughs> they beat Tornado? What? <laughs> Did you not know this? <laughs> they put them up on their side. 
<laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I always forget that you don't necessarily remember this stuff. I mean, like, I obviously I, I know Dear Tor, I know Tornado. In my mind, Tornado is this just amazing robot that I like for the most part. A couple of things accepted. And, um, and Dear Tor. <laughs> I know what those couple of things are. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And Dear Tor has always been a joke robot that I never, I don't remember ever winning anything. So yeah, it's all quite funny that, <laughs> quite funny to me at least, that, that, that uh, Dear Tor has beaten Tornado. Dear Tor did very well in some tag team tournaments as well by virtue of teaming up with very good robots. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I just find it, I'm not going to say that I'm upset about the whole joke robot thing, but because I value that innovation and value anyone attempting to do the same thing differently... I don't want that to be seen as the reserve of teams that can't take it seriously. I think you should be able to come in and do things seriously with something that is innovative or non-meta. Yeah, it's I think it's I think it's probably quite hard to come in with something that's different in in like like obviously different not the meta and all that kind of stuff and and still be taken seriously. The first time I saw Nuts and Nuts 2, I think I've panned it every other time I've seen it as a ridiculous robot that can never win anything. And obviously, I couldn't be, couldn't have been more wrong about that. And um, so that's with been... nuts one, you were right. Yeah, but like I, I remember, like when we talked about nuts two the first time, I think I would have panned it then. And I've, I've, you know, it was sort of the fact that he did, we didn't see it working. If you know, there were robots like, like rapid or whatever, like where you look at them and go, well, they didn't work this time, but you can sort of see, well, if they fix all that, then that's going to be a good robot. Whereas nuts two is like even if they fix the melty brains is that going to be a good robot i don't know and i I didn't think it would be but um i thought it'd be interesting not necessarily good and um so it's i I think it's very hard to come in with a robot that's that's so far out from everyone from what other people have seen for the most part and and still have everyone be able to sort of see that potential and, and 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 take you seriously um I think it's just, you know, and especially if you're coming out wearing fur, I think it's inevitable that you're going to be seen as a bit of a joke robot until until you take out Carbide. And then it's like, oh, wow, they are, they are an amazing robot, really. I think Nuts 2 is a very good justification of my tendency to look at robots in terms of their potential as much as their performance. In that it had trouble, but I prefer to see what it could be rather than that limited subsection of performances. Which is why I still say that Iron Ore 6 is a very good robot that had troubles in this instance. <laughs> Damn it, man. <laughs> right. If the first time you saw Usain Bolt do 100 metres, he fell over, <laughs> and you said he was terrible, you'd look a right fool with the next Olympics, wouldn't you? Yeah, but that's fine. Like, I'm, 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 I'm okay to look a fool. I don't, I don't mind that. But like, I'm don't, I, I think it's equ- I think you look that's equally. Good. I think you look equally <laughs> foolish if you keep constantly saying these robots or these whatever that. Demonstrably, demonstrably bad in every time we've seen them. Keep, keep saying, "Well, they could be good." It's like, well, anything could be good, but until it is good, it's not good. So for me, you know, like I, I, I can see where you're coming from with with iron ore being a good. I mean, you know, like I said, like you know, it's it's a wedge. It's got a flipper. It should it should be all right, but it, it hasn't worked once this series, and I've never seen it work. So you know, f- f- the evidence that I have at hand, it's not a good robot. I suppose Iron Ore 6 is a poor choice of example on my part because there is an overwhelming base of evidence that it is good and this is very clearly the anomaly. (laughs) But I suppose my overall outlook could also be described as it's hard to prove a negative. Which if you're (laughs) going to have these arguments is probably quite a safe position to take now I think about it. (laughs) Basically, you can't prove it can't be good. (laughs) It's a very tactical way of looking at the world, I've just realised. I'm not necessarily happy with myself. Yes, tactical. What did you think of the judge's decision here? Because Rory was obviously surprised. Um, I think it was the right choice. I think Nuts did the damage. They had the control. I think they were, I think they were about as aggressive as they could have been, given, given the way their robot moves. Um... I do think it was the right choice. I think it's hard to sort of know what well, is that the right choice because because it's the right choice or because it's just sort of such an amazing thing to have happened. I don't know. You see, that's the thing. I still think it was the correct choice. But at the time, I sort of said to myself, well, this is completely clear cut. It's 100% theirs. 
And I think it's a little more grey than my original sort of outlook on it was. I still agree with it. I still even agree with it being unanimous. What I want to know is how the actions of minibots get scored by the judges. Because technically speaking, Nuts 2 is a robot that is basically incapable of showing aggression. So to me, had Carbide been able to drive at it a few times and just sort of barrel into it, especially when it wasn't spun up, it might have shown enough aggression to overcome the defeat on damage. Mm. I mean, as it as it was, I mean, these like I said, your nuts can't really show aggression, and um, Carbide was prevented from showing aggression by the minibots. And at that point, you know, nuts is nuts is the one that's done all the damage. You know, Carbide haven't done any damage to nuts two at this point. So I do, I you know, so talking talking about it now, I, I do think it was you know, as far as the rules and stuff go, I do think it was the correct choice as well. Um, oh yeah, it's a correct choice on every single level. But yeah, it is it is interesting to sort of consider how how the minibots come into it what do they uh how do they count i'd imagine they count just the same as, as as the big robot i would have thought like you know you're entering them as one as one kind of thing one unit and if you've got a mini bot that's doing all the aggression then i i think it makes sense that that you get the aggression points for it so we're in our hypothetical cluster of 70 robots if we just send 34 of them into the face of the opponent do we then win on aggression <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think not that any rule stands up to this kind of extreme test. <laughs> I think I think once you put seventy bo seventy mini bots in an arena, I think there's a, a lot of other things to consider as well. Um, <laughs> be like a horse swatting flies with its tail. It'd be great. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know. I guess. I guess it sort of depends what what the opponent does. I mean, I think if it's, if it's a similar situation where the opponent doesn't do any meaningful damage to any of the any of our robots, then then yeah, sure. We I think I think we should get that on aggression. Alternatively, can we just make like six door stops and just drive them under an opponent and leave them there? So what are the what are the pinning rules then? Because that's what that's nearly what happened to to yes. Carbide was because they was it this one that yeah they were on they were stuck on top of a mini bot for nine and a half seconds or something silly like that. And, nine point uh, nine 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 <laughs> seconds. And uh, yeah, so like, is what 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 are the rules about how long you can hold an opponent for and whether or not that counts as a uh, as as a uh, as a knockout? The short answer is I don't know. The long answer is I don't know in a one on one fight, but in a melee, being pinned seems to count as a defeat. We saw that with Androne versus Concussion. Yeah. Versus nuts, actually, as well. I've just realised. <laughs> So yeah. I think that in the melee, it would have counted. In a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not sure. I feel like if it weren't allowed, then a house robot would have come out to separate them. Yeah, that's true, actually. That yeah. would be the easy way of dealing with that problem. Yeah, and that kind of thing has happened, actually, hasn't it? Where Because it was with, with Apex and and, whoever, and Terahertz and whoever else. They're all stuck on the flame. And Vulture, pitch, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Shunt came and, and freed them. Well, it's not, it's not quite the same, but I think it's probably the closest analogy that immediately springs to mind. Um, yeah, that was a melee as well, but I suppose when all three robots were pinned, you can't really have a winner. Yeah, it wasn't really like it was not. It's not as if one was intentionally pinned by another, though. They were all just sort of stuck. Um, Although concussion wasn't intentionally pinned by Andro. Although that's a situation where they couldn't have separated them if they wanted to. No, yeah. Oh. Know, that took time out of the arena to get that done. <laughs> all these, all these grey areas. The arena is a grey place. <laughs> It Although, is. at this point, there are at least rules again. So, you know, that's good. <laughs> yes, back to having rules. How do you feel the Carbide team were kind of cast in this episode? Did they want them to be villains, do you think? I don't know. They certainly seem to revel in their misery in the pits. Especially that excellent <laughs> interview where Dave just clearly isn't even aware there's an interview happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's just what? staring longingly at Carbide. Sort of, oh, what? He's, he's in a world of thought. Um, I think I think they're they're going to hype them up as as sort of like you know they, 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 there's a lot to be a lot of entertainment value I think to be to be extracted from having the uh, your previous winners struggling in any way um, so I think they're going to sort of try and you know contrast that with other things and and sort of really try and pull that out you know these they, they, they you know they were last series is winner and they were pretty definitive winners last series and and now they're back and they're and they're struggling quite a lot. So I think they were they were sort of painted in that way. I don't know that they were painted as particularly villainous. 
but yeah, villain was probably the wrong word there. But I don't know what the right word is. The thing is, like Carbide, they've always they've always been the robot or the team that are gonna that do things like you know hit other robots when they're already dead and do a lot of damage and show very little remorse for it. They've always always been like that. Um, so I, I I don't know that that's much of a spin. I just I just think they 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 just that's just the way they they operate. Um, so. I think I think there's sort of that coming through still that they you know that they they take it seriously they want to win and they don't show a lot of remorse when they uh, when they decimate an opponent and then yeah and then so that combined with the fact you know their their last series winners and stuff I think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna show them in a certain light I don't know how much intent there is there from the from the BBC or whatever but it wasn't too bad I don't think this has actually made me think back to series eight where obviously we saw Carbide for the first time. And I remember talking to a friend of mine afterwards and them saying, oh, I really don't like that Dave guy. And the reason they didn't like him, it was literally based off of one shot where they'd just come out of the arena after, I think it was taking nuts out, and they were facing Bayamoth next. And he just went over to Aunt Pritchard, slapped her on the back and went, it's you next. Which I thought was absolutely hilarious. You know, just a little bit of sort of in the pits, oh, here we go, kind of kind of conversation but it's it's weird how easily different people can strew something like that completely different ways yeah i think there's like a it's like a just quite a like a dry humor or or, or it's, you know, it's that kind of style of humor that, that i think some people find funny and some people just don't and you know yeah it sort of depends very much on your own on what on your own uh personalities to how how you react to, to that kind of thing of, of, of you know it's, it's you next and, and and a lack of remorse for destroying other robots and, and always being the robot that or the team that's gonna do a bit more damage than is strictly necessary and stuff and and you know I've I've, I've always been fine with it for the most part there's a couple of times where I felt it's a bit unfair but you know it's, it's robot wars it's, it's what it's what happens so yeah I think it's very very dependent on who you are <laughs> as to how you uh, how you feel about that team and we are definitely two people that are going to appreciate that. If anyone's going to, we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, We're I, I definitely love them. They're okay with that. Yeah, I'm totally okay with 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 there being a. Like I said, you know, in the same way that I I love the fact that Michael's there being the tactician. I love that you've got that you've got these guys there just just remorselessly destroying everything in their path, and and I think that's fine. Like I said, I think if everyone was like that, it would be a very different show. And uh, but you know, have, having one or two teams have that be 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 like the the villain a little bit be the bad guys it's, it's fine i you know and i think it adds it adds to the show adds to the flavor adds to the texture if you will i've just uh quickly checked my phone yeah i remembered what my new lock screen is <laughs> <laughs> that amazing picture of rory mangles after the judge's decision looking <laughs> bewildered <laughs> what's just happened <laughs> it is one of the most majestic stills i've ever seen from a tv show <laughs> brilliant I suppose we should at this point move on to the second melee because we've been on that first one for a long time and it is not even the best fight in this episode. <laughs> melee 2, let's start with Eruption. With Eruption, okay. I mean, I say that, we've basically covered Eruption, haven't we? There's nothing left to say. <laughs> not much more to say about them. They're still still an amazing robot, still amazingly driven and I and yeah. <laughs> nothing has changed over the last 10 minutes of no, this episode. Nothing, nothing has changed. Magnetar. Magnetar. Right. Magnetar is a drum spinner. Ellis himself says it. <laughs> Stunned silence. In his VT, he says that Magnetar is the highest kinetic energy of any drum spinner. How's it feel to podcast on your own, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just because someone says something doesn't make it true. That's the angle I'm going to attempt to take here and not really work very hard to justify. It still doesn't meet my definition. I don't think you can call that a drum spinner. I don't think you can call Hypershock's drum a drum, but they do as well. And, I mean, I'm clearly more knowledgeable than them, and they're going to have to just get used to my way of doing things. <laughs> and I just realised that this is exactly the kind of dry humour we were talking about that some people might construe as serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's the way, it, oh, it's the way it goes. It's funny, I didn't pick that out from Ellis's interview. What I did notice was that he seems to be trying to set some kind of world record for the number of times you can say the best in one sentence. <laughs> 
we noticed such different things. I think I was more excited about the prospect of of, of telling you that, that Ellis called it a drum spinner, <laughs> but I didn't notice anything else that he said. <laughs> I can imagine you just sitting there rubbing your hands together with glee, making a note. Pretty much. I was like telling Hannah to remind me to tell you <laughs> that he said that. <laughs> we did say at the end of the last heat that Magnetar hadn't necessarily been tested yet. It hadn't come up against anything that was going to give it huge trouble. And the cracks did start to show in this final. Yeah, it came up against things that it had to work hard hard to uh, to, to fight. Well, to be clear, it had to work hard to get past Thor. Let's not pretend that was an easy fight. But we started to see how difficult it is for a robot like that to hit things multiple times and keep going. It didn't fail in the same way that Pulsar would always fail, which is to go up in a ball of smoke. But it still didn't have that ability to keep on hitting. No, the, um, well, the, the, the Shremek was a, was a one hit wonder. <laughs> Only ever worked once yes. per, per fight. I think, I think that he, I think he burnt out the motor in the Shremek, but you know, we'll, we'll have to see. And, um, and, oh, and the drum, and the drum would keep, uh, would, would work for a bit. And then, and then it sort of seemed to stop. And it didn't, it didn't stop at an obvious ball of smoke. So I don't know why it didn't work anymore, but but it wasn't quite as reliable as, as, as I wanted it to be. The Shremek one is weird because you have to imagine, and maybe I'm completely off piste with this, you have to imagine that's probably the lowest tech part of the robot. I would have thought so. Yeah, it should be one of the simplest parts of it. <laughs> of all the things you would expect to fail, that's probably the one you would list last. It's just sort of, it's amazing that it sort of, because it, it worked to to write itself again, but he just never, he never got it closed again. And I don't know if he just, I don't know if he was, I don't know if he forgot to close it, and then by the time he realised it was still open, it was it was too late because it couldn't like didn't have the strength to put itself back in the correct position once the weight of the robot was on it or not. I don't know. It's just I of, would be stunned if that were an issue. I would be stunned as well. I, I just don't know. It's just sort of so weird that it, it will work one way and then just stay stuck open. It seems like an odd problem to have. I suppose when you're having to work as hard as Ellis must have to work to get a robot together that is effective and beautiful and compact if you are gonna slightly drop the ball on one part it would be a part like that and i think that's why you make version two of a thing yeah i look forward to seeing magnetar version two. Oh yes and let's face it guaranteed accepted guaranteed <laughs> i would hope so i would hope there so. are some robots that no matter how many series we have if they enter they're in carbide behemoth nuts whatever Ellis makes, they're all pretty much guaranteed. I hope I haven't cursed that for anyone now. <laughs> yeah, that's because you said that now. The BBC, they're going to they're gonna deny, deny Ellis entry to spite us. They're going to realise that he's no longer a boy genius and is a man genius. And they're just not going to care. <laughs> it's going to cast him out with the rest of the trash. <laughs> yes, they have, they have many man geniuses, but not not many uh, not many boy genii. Man genii. <laughs> genii. I, I, I don't know if that's actually the plural or not. No, geniuses, surely. There's no way in hell that's genii. <laughs> uh, that's a debate that could run far longer than I want it to. <laughs> no, I'm going I'm to use my argument as I use the same argument I use for octopus. It is an English word. It pluralises like Engl all other English words, or most other English words. And Yeah, like I sheep. And I shall... <laughs> Sheepiest and uh, it is geniuses. Sheeps is it's fine. Sheep eye. Sheep eye. <laughs> Shy. <laughs> I nearly burst into a song and I'm very glad I didn't. Rapid. Let's move on to Rapid, yeah. <laughs> For the first time, we get to see Josh talking without there being some manufactured sinister undertone to what he's saying. <laughs> oh, it's so they're all they, that whole team, they're just having a nice time and it's and it's wonderful to see. <laughs> yeah and we find i think this is actually the time where we really see the power that's in the robot as well with that massive self-writing flip <laughs> with well, the double back flip and then a face plant at some point as well they said in their ama that they thought their best flip was in the first fight of this episode and it turns out they weren't flipping anyone in it it was just flipping themselves and they were absolutely right it was magnificent that was astonishing i th i think their face plant later on was the funniest thing i have seen in river wars <laughs> in a long time <laughs> it was the nearest thing to a puddle of robot you could have <laughs> it was just oh they might have one more self right in them bang 
boom, it's like there, there's no coming back from that. It's just uh, so ridiculous. It's like a, an overexcited dog that's trying to bite the floor or something. It's just, <laughs> it's just such a ridiculous sight. <laughs> it's funny as well that we said the self writer on Magnetar was probably the lowest tech part. The lowest tech component on Rapid is what's failed, and that is the bungee cords that shot the flipper. Because normally they do such a great job. Ah. Oh. I want to know why it's so slow, man. I still want to know. I've had no answers to this. Tell me, Reddit. Tell me, why does it take so long for that flipper to reset? <laughs> it must just be a sort of sticky cylinder, mustn't it? I have no idea. <laughs> That's how dirty that sounded. <laughs> <laughs> Family-friendly podcast, Ryan. Family-friendly podcast. <laughs> we try. <laughs> we try, and, and, we then, and, then, and then I ruin it in the edit. <laughs> right. There was a thing that I was going to say earlier, and I'm remembering to say it. The magnet part of Magnetar mm -hmm. is really working in this fight. Look how well that turns with the drum at full speed. Completely planted. And then, look how hard it is for Eruption to flip it. Is that why it wasn't work? I was like, what's going on with Eruption's flipper? I sort of, I sort of forgot about the magnets. I was assuming that Eruption was having a problem with its flipper. As if the magnets that meant it couldn't lift it. I didn't... I mean, first of all, I could be wrong. It could be that Eruption was just low on power for whatever reason. It had taken a few hits off of Magnetar at this point. Maybe a bit of pressure had been lost, but there was no obvious venting. I noticed it more in the Behemoth fight, where Behemoth lifted its front and it came down in a really unnatural way that made me remember the magnets were there. In that it sort of went up onto its back, started falling down, and then partway through the fall, really started falling down. It sort of accelerated downwards all of a sudden. And it just looked really weird. And that sort of, oh yeah, they've got about, you know, 200 kilos of pull there. <laughs> because kilos are a measurement of force. <laughs> sort of. Ish. You know what I mean, though. Oh, uh, you were insufferable. <laughs> yeah, there was. It was. Yeah, interesting. Interesting that those those magnets are there. I I mm, I still think Eruption was having problems with its flipper, even with the magnets, because the, because Matilda's. I mean, Matilda's probably got. A, I don't know if it's got a more powerful flipper than Eruption or what, but Matilda didn't seem to have any problem tossing Magnetar around a bit at the end. So it also helps that Matilda was doing it from the side, not the front. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. The other unsung hero of this battle is the side pods on Eruption. They've got that big, what I think is rubber bar along the bottom that has really taken the sting out of a couple of hits off of Magnetar. It's either rubber or some quite high density plastic. But you can see it's just taken those gouges out and it wasn't getting buffeted around as much as you would expect. No, I think there's partly that. I... I... I, I do think Magnetar wasn't getting un, wasn't getting quite the bite that it probably wanted to in this fight, in terms of you know yeah like grabbing onto a robot to to really do damage and throw it around. Well, no, they threw Rapid up and over well enough. They they got they got that one hit at the beginning, yeah, like that big hit there. But I think after after that, I, yeah, I don't know. It was I think I think um, Eruption's side pod things part of it. I also think that that uh, Magnetar maybe not getting the hits that it wanted to. Maybe. 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 Perhaps. <laughs> Terrible. I feel like I should have more to say about this melee, but after the one that went before it, how can you? This was good. I mean, so this this is funny because it's the final the final nail in um in one of my in the coffin for one of my predictions, which was that I thought it was going to be carbide or rapid to be the winners, and then they've both ended up in the uh, in the redemption rounds as a result of these melees, which made me laugh. Yeah, but bear in mind that Eruption didn't even win its heat <laughs> and has come through. So being in a redemption round isn't that much of an issue. No, but it was still, still, you know, it still made me laugh that the two robots I thought were most likely to win were, were not. They didn't, have, they didn't have a strong start. And it does also mean that we've got a battle coming up between Carbide and the robot I thought had the best chance of ousting Carbide. So my predictions didn't do very well either. <laughs> Before that, though, we've got Behemoth Magnetar. Yes, yes, we do. A battle of ground clearances, really. <laughs> it's funny, like Behemoth had the edge, I think, on the f like the first one or two contacts of, of, of ground clearance that got under Magnetar quite easily, and then 
I don't know if something on the scoop bent a little bit and then Magnetar was under Bear Moth every time after that. Well, one of the nice things about having any kind of vertical spinner really is that if you get under something once, you usually damage that edge enough to get under it again. Yeah, you've, you've opened the hole, opened the window for you to, uh, to keep doing it. But of course, the self-writing issues are what's killed Magnetar here again. Actually, you know, no, I'm going to take that back. Driving is potentially what's killed Magnetar here as well. So had Ellis not gone to keep sort of pushing Bear Moth a bit in this, had he left it to the judges, who do you think would have won? I'm not sure it would have gone to the judges because Bear Moth weren't moving out of their radius. So with that in mind, then, do, do you think that Ellis left it long enough because he, because he mentioned it after the fight that he he did leave them for a bit and they didn't seem to be being counted out. So it was like, well, I've got to keep doing something. Um, so do do you think that he just didn't leave it long enough for the judges to start counting them out? Possibly. I do think that Bayamoth could have moved out of their circumference if they'd spun around and used the flipper, because that would probably have thrown them far enough. I don't know if the judges would have accepted that, but mm, I mean, so after after Bear Moth had, had won, they 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 did do that. They they were flipping and they were moving out of their radius. Um, but I think I feel like judges have accepted movement that's as uncontrollable as that, if not more uncontrollable, as movement outside of their radius before. So I I think they probably would have done like in earlier series. Yes, I don't know about now. I think things have been clarified a bit. I still think like sometimes when when robots have been when robots have been like similar to, to Behemoth here, where they've got one side of their drive not working, if they've been able to gyro dance, that seems to have sort of kept them in. Because I feel like... That's pulse... a very specific controlled form of movement, though, isn't it? Is it? That's just, oh, I still don't think it's controlled. I don't think that's controlled movement. It's more controlled than turning and flipping so you go over. It's the same thing, though. You're just sort of like exercising sort of like weirdnesses in momentum to move yourself around. But it's based entirely upon the use of your wheels. It is moving your wheels that is creating that movement mm. Mm. whereas i think firing your weapon to move is a slightly different ball game mm. what i will say is that i think behemoth will have known they could have moved out of that circumference and chose not to because where they were next to the flipper was a very good place to be if pulsar decides to, sorry magnetar number two times i've done that that's a good place to force Magnetar to come and get you when their Shreemek is broken because you can flip them or the arena can. So I think it is very good tactical driving from Behemoth, which, considering that a tactical lapse is what cost them last series, is very <laughs> nice to see. Behemoth had a lot of tactical driving in this. I think we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later <laughs> in this in this episode. Um, yeah, so do you, reckon, do, you reckon, um, do you reckon the judges would have given it to Ellis had it gone to judges then? Or not? Damage he obviously has. Mm -hmm. Control I don't think he would get. He seemed to be saying that there were some radio issues. Which you have to imagine was probably something to do with the aerial. For it to be that intermittent. But that's by the by. So hark back to, uh, to Series 8. <laughs> well, yeah. Aggression is a tricky one to call. I think... They've both been aggressive. I think up until that point, Behemoth is probably the slightly more aggressive. And I suppose at that point, to get the judge's decision, you have got to go in a bit while they're semi-mobile. It's whether you have to go in the way he did. Yeah, I think Ellis has made exactly this judgment call of like, well, if it does go to the judges, I don't think I've got quite enough in aggression. So he's, he's got very little choice but to sort of take that risk and keep trying to hit them a little bit. It's just, yeah, very unfortunate in... in in the timing of, of one of those runs there. It just seemed like he... And this is very nitpicky, which is entirely what we do here. <laughs> really? It was a weird angle to go in from, because the reason he got flipped, I think, is that he found himself between Behemoth's flipper and the floor flipper. Yeah. And at that point, he was kind of boned. Yeah, I wonder if he should have like moved around the side and tried to push Behemoth toward the flipper or something. Yeah. Because ultimately... They're the ones that can't move out of a certain zone. You've got all the time in the world to try and get around to an angle that suits you. But we're saying this with the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> in the heat of the moment, it's got to be a very different equation. Oh, yeah. I just, yeah. He had a very tough decision and he did what he did. 
just unfortunate the way that he went the way he did, really. And the other thing you have to really praise is the timing of that flip. That was very well done. They didn't have a big window to get that done in. No, he was barely barely on the scoop there when they fired that thing. It was it was good. And again, because he's got them from behind instead of from the front, it's actually gone over because those magnets are on the front. Whereas taking over from the back it seems a lot easier. Yeah. Just a little hoik over and it's done. <laughs> Final little push. But of course, that isn't the uh, major loss for Ellis. The big loss is the screw. <laughs> R.I.P. Ellis's screw. Oh, poor guy. Right at the end there. Just like it really was insult to injury, wasn't it? Just probably the result is like, oh, that's gone. That's it. Life over. <laughs> On camera as well. Just <laughs> and it's gone. That was very funny. That <laughs> moment. Though. Something else I noticed before this fight was that Ant was making a very strong point about Behemoth not being an old robot. And if you think it is, you're probably an idiot. <laughs> no, Which if I you very think, much enjoyed seeing. If you think it is, on, you're not looking closely enough. That's what that's. He didn't, he didn't call people an idiot. He said you're just not looking close enough. I'm reading between the lines here. <laughs> the subtext. And I loved hearing that because it had been mentioned earlier in the episode by I can't remember which presenter. Oh, Behemoth is a really old robot. <laughs> no, it's not. It's just it's just not. <laughs> it's been worked on constantly. It's been rebuilt and rebuilt and remade and remade. They've just been very faithful to the original design. <laughs> is that to their detriment, I wonder, to keep going with that design? Depends what you're looking to get out of being at Robot Wars. I think there are lots of builders out there who could make a really boring meta design and be more successful than they are with their current machines and they would have far less fun doing it and get far less satisfaction i think that if you're gonna put the amount of time and energy and frankly money as well as these people do into doing it you might as well create something that you love that should be the first part so yeah maybe they'd have more success on the tv series with a different robot They've had success in the live scene, so that's also something to think about. But would they be as happy as what, with what they've made? I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to you'd have to ask them. It reminds me a bit of um, in back when Top Gear was good. Uh, they constantly, uh, the three of them would constantly argue about the uh, the Porsche nine eleven, which has its engine way out the back, and it's sort of like the port that that car is an amazing refinement of a fundamentally silly idea um, of like, you know, how, how good can we make a car with got all this weight over and out behind the back wheels and stuff. And I think, you know, Behemoth is, it's not, it's not a silly design at all, but it is, it is, it is an older design and it has its problems and its flaws and stuff. And I think it's probably the best it can be and still, be bear moth and i think for them to build a better robot at this point it's like a significantly better robot i do think they'd have to rethink some fundamentals of the design of of, of bear moth or build something else entirely and by doing so i think we'd all lose more than we'd gain yeah yeah well we'd lose bear moth and we'd lose a <laughs> we'd lose a uh a titan in the world of uh, of robot wars it's becoming a really tired point on my part but oh dear not everyone's out to come first <laughs> Yeah, well, they should be. <laughs> In Sam's world, everyone thinks they're a winner. <laughs> In Sam's world, there can be only one winner. <laughs> talking of which, you know, talking of some people being slightly more competitive than others, I don't think Ellis necessarily appreciated the tactical insight of Kane Aston after the fight. Ray basically came over and said, Ah, oh, if your Shreemek had worked, you'd have won. <laughs> Thanks, Kane. No one had noticed. <laughs> I really hope that was Kane now. If I've got the wrong person, I'll be a bit silly. Oh, that was a that was a, a cruel thing to say. <laughs> I think he was trying to sort of console him. <laughs> console really work in good humour. Sort of like it was really close, you know. That he was admitting that they got a bit lucky with that flip at the end. <laughs> oh mate, you should have won that. It just doesn't help. Doesn't help us all. You were robbed by our swing. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that hits so close to home right now. <laughs> something something happened in the world of football recently, has it? A little bit. 
a little bit. I don't I'm want sorry. to talk about it. I'm sorry. Should we move on to uh, carbide versus rapid then? Oh, if, if there's any, if there's anything to get my mind off of Oxford City right now, it is this. <laughs> oh, I'm the kind of person that complains about people who watch Formula One for the crashes. But I'm completely okay with anyone that watched this purely for the fire. If you watch this and the only bit you enjoyed was this fight, <laughs> I'm okay with it. That's right. I think b before we get to the fire, I just want to point out how damn close Rapid were to taking Carbide out of the competition at this point. Like, if they had just waited half a second even longer on that flip, I think they'd have had Carbide out of the arena. You know, it's weird. Normally, when Rapid gets someone up on that flipper arm, their first move, their first instinct almost, is to drive them around somewhere. And the one time they didn't is the one time they'd have really benefited from being a metre closer to that wall. Yeah. Because they have, they have the advantage at that point. Because they're under Carbide. Carbide can't do anything else to damage them anymore. Um, I guess there's sort of a bit of... It's a bit of a, a gamble with how long you're willing to let them stay up there. Like if you if they're up there longer, they're more likely, I think, to be able to drive away from it in some way. So there is, I suspect, a time window where they can reliably fire the weapon and have something useful happen. Um, it's just so unfortunate that it was so so close to an out of the arena early on in that fight, and then and then just not quite getting it, and then they just didn't get another chance after that. Uh, Carbide Carbide came back with a vengeance after that, and uh, immediately. Tore them, tore them in half, pretty much. At which point, Rapid started smoking. Is there any more beautiful sight than lipo smoke? <laughs> this was a fog of war created by war, and it was glorious. Thick, white, hanging low, completely noxious. <laughs> it, it's the best smoke. <laughs> it is the kind of smoke that tells you something brilliant has just happened. Yeah. Something has just gone very, very wrong. I'm amazed at how long they kept driving it around with that smoking. Oh, yes. That's a very hardy robot they've got there. Yeah. It's, it's a tough, tough little machine. Yeah. This is one of those times as well where, like I said, it's saying earlier, Carbide hits after the, it's clear their opponent is dead. And they kept doing it here as well. They, they hit it a few more times when, uh, when Rapid had stopped moving. Was. You feel like the Rapid team were probably okay with that. Oh, definitely. Absolutely fine with it, I'm sure, at this point. They seem very happy to go out in a ball of fire. And I, I think it was it Josh that said at the end that that's like the best way to go out of Robot Wars, and I com I completely agree. <laughs> if you're going to leave, you've got, you the best two ways to leave Robot Wars are either winning or in, or in a ball of fire. You have to imagine that no matter what the result was this series this team were probably going to do a whole new robot anyway. So I feel like they didn't necessarily care what happened as much as a lot of other teams would have. It was amazing how little they cared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th th there are some teams... I mean, imagine that happening to Behemoth. Oh, Ant would be devastated. There would be, I think, genuine tears in that control booth. Yeah. And they would be justified. <laughs> and it would be on the verge of sacrilege to do it, really. <laughs> totally worth it. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, it, it would be it it would be like desecrating a statue. You know, it'd be just awful. Whereas with Rapid, it is very much this is spectacular. There's no ounce of pain for the viewer as they watch that. There's no mixed emotions or conflict. It's just all beautiful. I wonder how much of that is because the audience have sort of been. Not not necessarily turned against rapid, but sort of like you know the whole sort of like rich rich guys type thing. Um, wonder how much of it is because it's like well you know ah, watching a really expensive robot catch fire is in some way satisfying to the general public. <laughs> Last series, I was fully on board the Schadenfreude train when they went out. That didn't even occur to me as it was happening. No, it didn't occur to me at all. The the other thing that's sort of only occurring to me now is I wonder I wonder how much their reaction and complete lack of being upset that their very expensive robot has just caught fire sort of like plays into plays into that image that they have of, of i mean cause i think josh in his vt was like well if we're going to be the rich guys we're, we're going to paint it gold and stuff and, they, and so they've done that and then they're like oh, twenty five thousand pounds going to be fire and they're just laughing about it <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll build another and it'll be even more gold <laughs> i mean when you spend that kind of money on things Oh, sorry, on, sorry, on things, that's a general thing. When you spend that amount of money on a robot, you have to accept two things. One, you might lose all of it. 
two, you will get judged for it. And they've clearly accepted both of those things and decided it's worth doing anyway. Oh, yeah, they they, they were... I think they were really great sports. They were really funny yeah, to watch. They were fantastic. I, yeah, fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely great people, I think. And also a very good robot. <laughs> An astonishingly good robot, yeah. It I, took a lot of hits there. It's, it is very tough. And I, I, I love seeing that drive system every time we see it. All those cogs, it's so... Oh, it's gorgeous. It's so unnecessary. It's great. <laughs> it's so unnecessary that it becomes necessary. It's wonderful. <laughs> Something else you could really notice in this fight is that they have gone for a much more modular build than before. They've learned that lesson. Because you could literally see modules falling off. Yes, this is this is much more repairable than last time. Although one thing that I think they wouldn't have been able to repair even if they had come through that fight is the flipper arm. That shattered, didn't it? Yeah. That's astonishing. I don't know what that was made of. But that's a very interesting failure mode. I mean, the the, the front edge of it was was like real, like proper hardened steel, wasn't it? Like yeah, the it's little... tool steel, which you would expect to shatter. Yeah, I would have expected that front bit to shatter, and then everything else to sort of twist or bend or tear, and it to be ob and it sort of looked like it had been torn. But this just this was just a clean shatter. It was like it was made of glass or something, and they'd just taken out that whole corner of the of the uh, of the arm there. It was yeah, quite. I imagine most things shatter if you hit them hard enough and uh, Carbide clearly hit them hard enough. As a final point on Rapid, I feel as though they have come agonisingly close to proving my point about wide flippers against big horizontal spinners. <laughs> Is that so? Because that front panel, until that point, hadn't really taken any damage. And they were getting under very well and they were flipping very well now... There are other elements of the design that are very good, that are possibly more pertinent. But I feel like it's a slight tick in that box for me. Not so much that I would base a whole argument on it, not so much that I'm going to sit here doing a sort of, haha, I was right. <laughs> but I am going to store it away for future use, you know? Okay, add that to your little collection. Collection of data there to make this. It's a very little collection. <laughs> <laughs> Got a folder on your desktop with what? With one one thing in it now, or is it two things? <laughs> There's a couple of text files, you know, <laughs> mostly empty. <laughs> Semi-final time. Yeah. And a very familiar matchup in Eruption Behemoth. Yeah. I dread to think how many times these two robots have fought. <laughs> Ant looks tense, to say the least. <laughs> he has the look of a man that came in expecting nothing and has now realised how close he is to everything. Yeah. Oh, man. He was so close. So close to a, to a win. Once again, it's completely the correct decision. Yeah, so Eruption yeah, eruption is just, is just far more aggressive and in far more control of, of the fight and everything in, in, in this thing. So it is, is the correct thing, the correct outcome here. They was, were all over Behemoth for pretty much the whole fight. I mean, so they, 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 yeah, with the exception, they had like a bit of a weak start, I think. Eruption, not Eruption, a, a Behemoth got, um, got a good, really good start and then just didn't, couldn't, couldn't sustain that for the whole fight. And, uh, I don't have a I don't have a huge amount to say about the fight, but it was a really good fight. I really enjoyed watching it, and I I really enjoyed watching it the second time as well. It's um because it's just it's just a, it's a properly good fight of two really well matched robots duking out for 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 the three minutes and stuff. It's it's ah oh, yeah, it was a really good fight. It's one of those fights where, as a viewer, you go into it knowing that rather than one robot losing one robot is going to win, if that makes sense. You know, it isn't like one of them's going to go in and just spontaneously break down. Whoever wins is going to have worked for it. And going into it, really, a judge's decision was almost the most likely outcome. It was that, a pitting, or Behemoth going out. It was always going to be a fairly even match. I mean, Eruption were always favourites. It was always going to be an entertaining match because they're two excellent drivers with very controllable machines. And it completely lived up to that billing. <laughs> there are there are a couple of a couple of shenanigans. I just wanna I just wanna raise here. See what you think of there them. Are always shenanigans. They're always shenanigans. Um, at some point, Bear Moth does a heck of a lot more than breathe near the pit button, and nothing happens. <laughs> Bear Moth properly rams into it, 
nothing happens. So it's like, what? Have they already hit it before? No, no, this was right near the beginning. Uh, they, they, they didn't hit the button. They hit sort of like the area around the button. And we've seen repeatedly earlier that that's enough for whoever controls the, the thing to actually trigger it. And then nothing happened. It was sort of, it was a bit, a bit funny. <laughs> Shenanigans confirmed. The shenanigans confirmed. And the other the other shenanigans were the was the the floor flipper. The floor flipper has been made of shenanigans this series. <laughs> it's powered by shenanigans. It's <laughs> built of shenanigans. It's 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 controlled by shenanigans as well. <laughs> Pure shenanigans. So it was it was extremely kind in this in this fight. It I, I don't think it went once and robots were on top of it like properly prime position for being flipped. No movement at all. <laughs> Does this perhaps indicate that it was perhaps broken? I don't... Was it... Bro yeah, I don't know, maybe, but, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows what happened? Broken or the producers just wanted it to be a, a long fight. Because it didn't... There were... This is not the only fight in this episode where it didn't go when I thought it should have done. So, you know, may maybe it was broken. I mean, at this point, you kind of have to go simplest explanation. It's broken. Let's not call shenanigans too early. He says, after his entirely shenanigans rant, it's all shenanigans except for when it's probably broken and that's fine. I can, uh, I can tell you something that's not shenanigans that I think will make you happy. Can I just say the word shenanigans has lost all meaning at this point? <laughs> carry on. Um, uh, in an earlier episode, you talked about ants driving and uh, he, he said he did something that was spectacular and intentional. And I sort of said, I think he just got lucky with when he did it. In this fight, he flipped himself off of Eruption's flipper so many times that I am forced to conclude that he was doing it absolutely on purpose. He would fire his scoop when he was on the on the Eruption's flipper so that he to, to get him off it, and then he couldn't be flipped out of the arena. And I thought it was amazing. And I hadn't even noticed. <laughs> <laughs> now that's some shenanigans right there. No. What's going on? <laughs> no more. No more. Yeah, texting, texting your mate. You know, this is you need to pay attention. Take this seriously. This is a legitimate <laughs> sporting competition. After I'd lectured Hannah about not missing a second of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Delivered a friendship ultimatum, essentially. <laughs> if you don't watch this whole episode, we're not friends anymore. <sighs> So consistent. Not at all hypocritical as well, here. No, I'm far too perfect to be hypocritical. <laughs> right, I suppose we should move on to this final semi-final. The final semi-final. The semi-final to end all semi-finals. Favourites for the tournament, Nuts 2 versus Underdogs Carvide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is shockingly accurate. <laughs> Nuts are genuinely favourites for this fight. <sighs> Until Carbide go all Team Tornado on them. <laughs> team Tornado, you think you think it's that bad, do you? Mainly because I wanted Nuts to win, but I think there are there are comparisons to be drawn. There are parallels. I think I think I think Carbide putting a Nuts guard on was entirely reasonable and not even close to things that Tornado have done and <laughs> <laughs> and not even close to some of the stuff that other other robots have done. Like, you know, when we talk about traction, borrowing parts from Vulture and, and stuff like, you know, teams, they, they do modifications for specific opponents and Carbide have done done so. They have done a specific modification for Nuts too by stealing Look, a bit of Rapid. <laughs> I'm just trying to play a casual game of Bait the Razor fan and you're getting in the way with it with all your facts and logic. And that's not okay. <laughs> I think the biggest mistake Carbide have made this series is not doing this for the melee. Mm. We all saw this coming. Yeah. Well, that coming. That, yeah. How did they not decide sooner that this might be a good idea? It's it's funny, isn't it? It's one of those things that you sort of didn't... Because I didn't think about it until, until I'd seen Nuts 2 working. I hadn't even thought about the possibility of something hitting Carbide's chain. And I suspect they hadn't either. Um... And then, and then, obviously, when they put the nut card on, seeing how little it took to sort of prevent that, it's sort of like, why wasn't that just there by default? Why was it ever exposed, even without knowing that nuts two exists and works? Why was the chain even exposed if it takes that little to cover it up? <laughs> you have to wonder what the carbide team were doing every time, every other time that nuts fought to not look at it and go, 
that's a risk. Yeah, if they, cause they you sort of think, I think we both, or at least I certainly sort of felt not to a real threat when they got that hit on Androne and took out its crusher. And that was sort of like, man, they, they, if, you know, robots, they have exposed parts in places that aren't usually hittable and nuts could hit them right there. And it was sort of like, that was, that was it. It was like, man, nuts, they could, they could take out carbide because they can hit that chain. And so, yeah, I did, why, why didn't they think of it? Why didn't they see that and go, we should cover that chain up? <laughs> well, they certainly thought of it this time. Yeah. And they thought of it now and I'm, Whatever robot they build next, I would imagine if it's if it's in a similar design, and I suspect it will be, it will have a nuts guard built right in. <laughs> Once again, in this conversation I was having while watching the episode, I naively went, well, nuts two should win this. I didn't consider the possibility of carbide putting that on. <laughs> Which, with hindsight, was pretty silly. Yeah, I mean, teams they like I said they they, they often put little additions on their robot to try and deal with deal with deal with the uh, their opponent and stuff. So. Made sense that they did it. Which the last time it happened against Nuts probably won them the fight. <laughs> there is, however, I think, either a flaw in Nuts or a flaw in the tactics in this fight. And that is that Nuts is rotating clockwise. Why is that a problem? Okay. Carbide's bar rotates clockwise. Carbide is rotating clockwise. That means that when the bar hits... There is one hell of an impact. Had Nuts been able to rotate anti-clockwise instead, the sort of closing speed, for want of a better term, between the bar and their ring would have been significantly less. That's true. Yeah, that is true. And I do wonder if that would have been the difference between that bar holding together and it not. And it, it, wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have affected the sort of effectiveness of their weapon. I'm wondering if the Melty Brains is only designed to work in one direction. Hmm. If it is only designed to work in one direction, that seems like a rather unfortunate oversight in the software that I would think should be, if it were if it designed properly, should be fairly easy to correct. It depends well, that how... Would you be a case of just inverting one variable? I, it, it, it depends like how deep the assumption goes about which direction it's going. If, if you've designed that software from the ground up with the assumption that it will rotate clockwise, you probably take a lot of shortcuts in the, in the design of that software to not have to consider the, the 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 alternative and stuff. So I think, you know, if it's been, yeah, if it's been built from day one with the assumption it's going to go clockwise and always go clockwise, then I imagine it's probably quite, maybe not hard, but certainly time consuming to go and, to go and fix all that. Whereas I think if you were, if you went into it from, from day one there with the understanding that we'll probably always go clockwise, but you know, we might want to go the other way. I think you'd probably change, change the way a lot of that code is structured and works such that there are like a few central locations in the code base that you go to for changing, yeah, like I inverting values or changing the sign or something like that um, for, for, for some of the maths that's presumably involved to, to make it work in the other direction. I think it should be a really simple thing to fix, but like if, yeah, if the assumption of clockwise has been made from day one, it might be quite deep in the code and quite time consuming to find and fix all of it. Although even then, surely if you just put it upside down, it's then going anti-clockwise. <laughs> Are you allowed to put your robot in upside down or not? This is a question that I've seen asked by other people. The rules now state that all safety devices have to work whether the robot is the right way up or upside down. So you feel like from a safety point of view, it should be fine to do that. I don't know if there's just a specific rule against it. Because you could also argue that Carbide, instead of putting that guard on, could have just got it upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought they'd do. I thought, oh, they'll just, they'll just put it in upside down and they'll be fine. Or at the very least, I thought if they didn't put a nuts guard on, they'd just, they'd just go for the floor flipper quite quickly in the beginning to get themselves the other way up. Of course, going back to the whole just spin anti-clockwise thing, there are two other possibilities we haven't spoken about. One, they just didn't think of it. Or two, they did think of it and it's a stupid idea that I'm massively overrating which we have to consider a very strong contender. So I, I don't think you're massively overrating it. I don't think it would make an enormous difference to to how much energy is uh, is transferred in that collision there, but it would make a difference. Um, and I think it's one of those things where 
every little bit counts. It might be it might be the difference between keeping that flail and losing it. Even 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 if you're going from one hundred and five percent breaking strain to ninety five percent breaking strain, you know, that, that you know that's not a huge. That's only like a ten percent like difference in energy there, but it's enough to go from it's broken to it's not broken, and and so you know you think you know it depends how close close to to the edge of uh, of what that material can sustain they were at the, at the time of, of that collision and stuff so i suppose the simplest way of looking at it is in a game of fine margins you take whatever edge you can exactly yeah you 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 take whatever you can there and you know if i think if, if it's easy to change the direction that nuts spins i think they they should have done it and if it's not easy then it's a shame and you should make it easy for next time <laughs> and of course once they do take the second big hit that really puts an end to them they're having some serious control issues at that point which again i have to assume has something to do with the melty brains which is then not receiving the inputs it expects and is not having a nice time electronically and is therefore just kind of sending seemingly quite random impulses to the motors i think there's a couple of things so there's i'm when it loses one of its flails i'm astonished at how balanced it still is yes that's amazing and then the other bit is is when it's right at the end when it's sort of lost all control i i i didn't see that as like melty brains failing or an electronics failure in any way it just looked like one of its wheels was was buckled and it just couldn't rotate anymore it looked like there were some very strange movements from the motors which is weird because if for example a robot loses or in some way cannot process the transmitter signal it should fail safe and just stop by default, which makes me think that something more complex was going on. Well, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like easy to say, oh, if, it, if it's not interpreting the signal correctly, then fail. But like, how how do you know what correct is? You know, like it, it, it may uh, be that's that, a good question. It may be that everything in that software was going, everything is fine, and it just it just wasn't. You know, it's you know how 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 do you tell that it's broken? It's quite a probably quite a difficult thing to tell from the inside i mean i'm no software engineer but i can't help feeling that once it's giving those kind of outputs it should probably know that it's not getting the right inputs but like but you've got to write the software to do that you've got to write the software for like monitoring itself and knowing knowing what sane inputs are and stuff like i'm, I'm not saying it's not possible i'm just saying that it's probably not high on priorities when you're designing a system like that i wouldn't have thought but who knows <laughs> what would you know <laughs> it's not like you're a software engineer or anything I, I know nothing of software but yeah it, it just left me wondering very slightly and very mildly whether nuts 2 truly fails safe i think it fails as safely as any other robot that's I think probably it, quite fair i think i think it fails more safely than apex does <laughs> so does dynamite <laughs> the other thing that we haven't mentioned as well from this fight is that well, I suppose you have mentioned it, but I haven't made this point again as much as I feel I need to. <laughs> you haven't made this point three times yet. <laughs> that, that's about what I'm aiming for. <laughs> Even after they've lost half the flails, they still land three or four hits on that armour. So I say it once again. Nuts 2 is not scoring lucky hits. It is doing this again and again and again. It is great design. And if anyone isn't convinced of that by now, they're a lost cause. <laughs> I would now step down from my soapbox so we can move on to the final. Okay, then. Ooh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Was this third time lucky for, uh, for eruption versus carbide here? <laughs> Aren't you glad they did those really stupid heat lineups to make sure we didn't get the same final all over again? <laughs> What can we say that we haven't already said? I right, there's not a lot to say about the fight. I don't think. I there's one thing that Jonathan Pierce said that I loved so much. <laughs> you can hear the drum, the drum of the bar spinner. <laughs> you know, I'd noticed it and not written it down, <laughs> and it's all come flooding back. Because we said this last last time we recorded, we said. I wonder if Jonathan Pierce would describe a bar spinner as a drum, and this is this is awfully close, <laughs> awfully close. I mean, <laughs> if this is a drum, then Magnetar's definitely a drum. <laughs> There's that at least. I think he's getting confused between the words hum and thrum, 
and then just fallen <laughs> in the middle at drum. It's the only explanation I can muster. Oh dear, it's so ridiculous. I was I was giggling with glee when he said that. <laughs> Oh, the drum of the bar spinner. Oh, amazing. Let's be clear here. Carbide is not very well at this point. No. And I don't say that to detract from Eruption's win at all, but they are clearly having some difficulties. I don't... Uh, I think... I, I I agree that Carbide maybe isn't 100%, but I don't think it's that far off either. It's still It's still making that huge sound when its bar is going at full speed it's still spinning up to full speed it's still doing it in a reasonably short period of time it's it's not is it i don't think it's smoking quite uh, it smokes a little bit in this fight but like it's i i think it's on on the bleeding edge of what it can still do at this point but it's not it's by no means like significantly weaker than it than it would be brand new oh yeah it isn't weaker it's just at a point of massively enhanced unreliability yeah um so it's you know it's it, it's got presumably it's weapon motor smoking a little bit and then they they uh, i don't know if they lose the mode the, the weapon for a bit or if they just choose not to use it for a while to let things cool down a little bit in there but like, there is smoke coming out i guess it's the weapon motor do you think it's something else from what was happening and i'm assuming that carbide uses one i would imagine it was the contactor and what is a contactor? It's basically a lower tech solution to spinning up a weapon than a speed controller. In that it's basically an on or off system. So what you will see Carbide do quite a lot is they will spin up the weapon and then it will coast for a bit and then spin for a bit and then coast for a bit and then spin for a bit. Because it is that on or off. There's no 50% throttle, 40% throttle, whatever. It is just we're giving it power or we're not. And... This is quite a tenuous assumption, but the fact it was such an intermittent fault makes me think it was probably that. Yeah, I think I, you know, I think it smoked for a bit. I, I think they probably, I think they intentionally maybe stopped like using it just to let it cool down. But, but I don't know. I mean, the fact that it didn't, it sort of like you know, I think if something smokes and then stops and you didn't intend for that to happen, that's usually a sign that it's, it's done for 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 the rest of the fight. Um, I don't but- think that they stopped it. I think it stopped and then came back. Because there's a point where Dave says to Sam, have you got weapon? And he says, no. I didn't catch it. He said, no, I just thought he didn't respond. <laughs> but could yeah. also have been that. I could be filling in a blank. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard hard to tell. But it's, you know, it, either way, it's it's a, it's an unreliable weapon at this point. It's intermittent with when, with when it's doing stuff. It's still doing huge damage. I mean, it's tearing holes in the front of... It's tearing holes in the front of Carbide there. Oh, no. oh man. <laughs> it's, it's tearing, tearing holes in the front of Eruption, isn't it? It's tearing holes in front of, in the front of Eruption, and, and Eruption looks like some kind of post-apocalyptic robot at the end there. It's almost as good as when... Well, not um, as much as the last two times. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's moving and stuff. It's almost as, almost as good as uh, Coyote at the end of some fight last series and stuff. It's The one that, against Carbide, yeah. Yeah, the one against Carbide, yeah. That, that kind of, yeah properly torn up type appearance it was quite yeah it's very very good and again here we are saying that there are all these issues for carbide michael has facilitated those issues in a way i suppose by doing such a good job of going into the bar and putting it under immense stress. He did such a great job this time of keeping the front of his robot at carbide and not the side. <laughs> yeah, as I said right at the beginning, there's that little sort of touch of just going in and angling himself so that he's being hit on the front, not the side. It's just... It is very much a fight that he's had two goes at already. He's learned what works. He's learned what doesn't. And yes, there was a tiny bit of weakness there but he's exploited that perfectly. He could not possibly have done any better. No, he's he's one with fantastic driving and tactics. And you know, in, in in that vein, you can see that you know he asks his dad how much time is left, and he hears, you know, someone someone in the vicinity of thirty seconds. And I I I seriously feel like at that point he just dials up to eleven. It's like right, there's only thirty seconds left, and he just goes for it. He gives he just gives it everything. He's so much more aggressive at that point. And it's like Carby barely touches the ground in that final thirty seconds. Yeah, it's just like he knows that a judge's decision is coming, and he knows that he needs to get the aggression points to win, and he just goes for it. And it's just yeah, so amazing to see. And Carbide is just running away because they 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 they. 
they've got to get away to to stand any chance of spinning their their bar up and you can see them trying and, and Michael's just not letting them do it it's just it's amazing <laughs> I'm trying to think was it you that I said this to or someone else where when it went to that decision I sort of went Eruption's going to win this and Michael won't even celebrate <laughs> you, thought, you or someone else I think that was someone else because the moment he made it through that fight for me, there was no tension whatsoever. He had won that fight. That was completely uncontroversial to me. I think it was uncontroversial. I, w- I couldn't call it. I was like, I don't know who's going to win, but I was absolutely fine either way. Oh, yeah. But when you've had a final that good, the result barely matters. Yeah. <laughs> My question to you is, do you think he celebrated? Really? Was that was that what celebrating looks like? I mean, that was like a... a just a massive just release of tension, <laughs> I think a bit of relief that he'd done it or something. I don't know. I think I I I I see where he's coming from with with the way he reacted to that because he's like when he talks about it's been like a lifelong dream for him to win Robot Wars. I I believe him. I I I I don't think he's hyping that up that much for television. Every uh, part of everything he does in the arena shows that. Yeah, it's sort of like so. I think there's just a huge just release. Of of whatever to be like, I've he's done it. He's he's achieved that thing. And I guess in that moment, some people will go mad and jump around for joy, and some people it's just exactly what he does, which is just like a almost just like a collapse of, of relief and just joy that he that he'd achieved it and stuff. I think I think he celebrated perfectly well. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm very much in the jumping around camp, so <laughs> I guess I wouldn't understand. <laughs> Is is there any more to say about this final? It it was just it was just amazing. It was just a really yeah. good fight. Really like like I said, both Hannah and I both properly into it. Really cheering Michael on. Both just cheering when he won and stuff. It was like it was it was so good, so good. A fantastic finish to a fantastic episode of a reasonably good series. <laughs> <laughs> an acceptable series. <laughs> no, it's more than acceptable. It was a good series, but this was this episode was is so far above every other episode. It's astonishing. <laughs> this is the epitome of what a final should be. Six almost entirely different machines with almost completely different merits with a bunch of different permutations of lineups that could completely change the outlook. It's it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It really is. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. But I'm now going to put you on the spot. Oh, no. Thanks to the 10-way, there was no third place playoff. Who would you give third place to? Ooh. Who would the third place playoff have been between it would have been right first things first i'm not saying this as imagine a hypothetical fight between okay. nuts two and behemoth this is like a judge's decision moment then you know you know they're not having a fight here who are you giving third to <sighs> of everyone else no it isn't of every, it's of oh, of behemoth and nuts of two. behemoth and nuts two nuts two go on i they, they just no. <laughs> is, is there any justification needed i think nuts two came third for me i think i mm, i guess i guess this is a more of a more of a, a, a uh, an emotional thing i guess of sort of like of, of being so wrong about them and so sort of amazed at how well they've done and i guess in part to in, you know if, if i could award the third place as like an encouragement to other people to do different things and and just you know a sort of yeah I think that's too. I th- I just think Bayamoth Bayamoth is a good robot. Uh, it's I've just never. It's it's a it's just much more of a middle of the road robot for me. It's not something. It's not a robot I've ever been hugely passionate about one way or the other. It's a very familiar robot. Um, whereas Nuts Two, I've gone. I feel it's been much much more of an emotional journey. I've gone from like that's a stupid robot to oh my god that's an amazing robot. And I do think they just did did amazingly well as well. I, I, I think, you know, emotional stuff aside, I do think they would deserve third place, I think. You see, to me, when you say that, it almost sounds like you're saying that they deserve it because they've overperformed. Maybe I'm misreading what you're trying to say there, because that sounds like a contradiction. 
Not one that I disagree with. Well, on one on one part, I agree they deserve third place. I wouldn't say they overperformed, but I can yeah, I I can sort of see the idea of overperforming. I think I mean I guess from my point of view, they have overperformed in some ways because because I didn't have high expectations for them coming in. Um, whereas you you like I said, you you focus much more on potential of things and you knew more about the melty brains and stuff. Uh, so maybe it's not quite the same sort of like above your expectations in in the way that it's it's above mine i i sort of had this in the same camp as robots like jellyfish and stuff of just just a silly joke robot that i didn't think could ever win anything and and here it is in the final you know so it's sort of it's yeah i think i think that's a big part of why i think it deserves third um, but there's also, you know, there's there's no ignoring the fact that it beat Carbide. Like, it flat out beat Carbide, and those mini bots are astonishing. And I, I think, you know, for all those reasons as well, it it deserves third place. You realise that Nuts only lost one fight all series, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd read that on the Reddit. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's a very good robot. <laughs> I mean, how many other robots only lost one fight? Oh, I don't know. If, hang on. They've lost the least fights of any finalist. Granted, they've had one fewer, but because, you know, Eruption has lost twice. Oh, hang on. No. No, Eruption has also lost once. I just had it in my head that they lost the final for a second there, which is <laughs> very stupid. So, you know, technically they're joint first. <laughs> is that technically? That's not how the rules work. You go technically when you're, like, expo exploiting some obscure element of the rules. Like, technically a monopoly, this is how it works. That's how that works. It's not like... Technically, this is how I want the rules to work. <laughs> I am exploiting a quirk of the rules. It just happens to be playground rules. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the then. only thing you can say to try and sort of strip nuts of that honorary third place is that they haven't come up against any design that would be strong against them, and those designs do exist. So Nuts would have struggled against Rapid or Eruption, for example. Nuts would have struggled against basically anyone else. I think it, I don't think it would have beaten... If they did a third-place playoff, I don't think they'd have beaten Bearmoth. Bearmoth would have won. Yeah, that's and, probably true. And I think, they'd, I think they'd lose against basically any flipper. Yeah, and I, I don't think we'll see them reach this point again, whereas Bearmoth, you could say it's maybe slightly more likely that they would match this. But you can only judge them on the fights they had. And on the basis of that, Nuts have absolutely smashed it. And they've produced, for me, by far the best moments of this series in doing so. Mostly just watching Rory look surprised, to be <laughs> honest. But... Yeah, a bit, a bit flummoxed about what's going on. Yeah, so good. And there ends the series. Mm. Do, you, uh, do you have a ratings system for this, uh, for this episode? I thought about it. And it almost seems inappropriate to rate this episode. So there's not, I am... There's not like something hidden in, in a drawer in my room again, is there? <laughs> <laughs> sadly not. No, sadly not. I'm, in, in a way, I've let you and everyone else down, but I let's face if, it. I don't know if I've ever made it clear that, that I had no idea. Like, Ryan <laughs> was, was here, uh, was like, I was out at some point in that on that day, and he had come to visit, come to see Hannah, and they had, they'd built this little model of jellyfish together and hidden it in the office that I recorded. And I had no idea at all. It was a complete surprise to me that that happened. It was like being in a film. It was ridiculous. I would like to point out that I did the majority of the building I'm at sorry. about three o'clock yes. the previous morning. We simply no. decorated. Decorated. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not getting my facts straight. But no, as I say, I think this episode is beyond rating. It is. It's above an all X that. out of X. <laughs> well, I think we, we covered at the beginning it's, it's pretty unequivocally the best episode of this series best episode of the reboot and possibly of in all of Robot Wars history I will now be spending a couple of weeks trying to find a better episode <laughs> and if I do there'll be an update excellent but I doubt I will <laughs> do we dare look ahead that is the question do we dare put together our series 11 wish list contemplations for series 11 if we operate on I the mean, assumption that it's going to happen, then yeah, we can... Uh... <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll allow ourselves that luxury. I, I think we all know our first item. Yeah, get rid of Fog of War. Yeah. Yeah. That's just <laughs> uncontentious at this point. It has to go. Yep. How do you feel the competition format has been going? <sighs> or did you have more to say about Fog of War? I, 
I, no, I think I'm, well, I'm not done with Fog of War, but I'm, for the purposes of not boring everyone to tears, uh, we can move on. Um, competition format, I I like it. I think this is an improvement. I think this addresses a lot of the issues that we had with the round robin thing. I like that we always get two fights, at least, out of a robot. Um, but there are problems with it that you've you've brought up that like the, the best robots get fewer fights and, and less screen time. Which is a bit unfortunate, and the other the other weakness of it is the complexity of 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 the format. It's it's not as obvious exactly what's happening. It sort of takes a bit more explaining and following. Uh, we've got these two rounds, and then and then there's redemption stuff, and then there's that, and then there's the third place playoff thing, and then there's the final. It's a sort of it's it's, it's more complicated than other potential formats, which is. Which is what it is, uh, you know. I, it's just a bit unfortunate, I guess. I don't know. Just, it's just, it's just, just, ah, it's just. It is what it is. <laughs> the other thing that I've been slightly frustrated by, and I don't know if it's avoidable or not, is the tendency for robots that were together in a melee to fight later on. I feel like there have been times where that's happened where it didn't need to, and I feel like that's just the result of a random draw. But at that point, I feel you sort of go away from random and just ensure the variety. Yeah, you could almost sort of be like, because when you've got those those redemption rounds and stuff, you you probably don't want a redemption between two people that are in the melee. Is that the situation that happens? Or is it in the semi-finals where it happens? I don't know. But there's there, there is definitely a round where you, you where you get f- robots fighting again. And yeah, if if it's a, if it's at all avoidable, I think it's worth doing. I, sh- I should have come into this better sort of prepped with an example of when it happened, but I haven't, so we'll live with it. Well, I mean, so in this one, it was Carbide, Carbide and Nuts fought pretty... Because well, it was so dominated in their melee, and then they fought again a bit later on. And then there were... There was definitely one more that I noticed, and but I can't remember it right now. But yeah, it happened. But it's fine, you know. Like this is the, the, the thing to be clear about is, is this competition format is so much better than the old one so much better so if they don't change anything about it the the competition bit of it anyway i'll, I'll be happy <laughs> and the really key thing is i think it results in fairer outcomes and that has to be for me at least objective number one of a competition format i guess i guess there's one other thing that immediately brings to mind actually about the competition format which is i guess it's less strictly the the competition format and more just a function of trying to prov- produce an entertaining TV show. So within the constraints of what they can do in this in this format, they have those heats that are lots of really big hitters, lots of like big, powerful robots. And then they have a couple of heats that are less good, like lots of weaker robots, lots of sort of less refined robots and stuff where, you know what I mean? Like it's sort of, I think because they're trying to get a TV show out of it, they gear a few heats to be particularly exciting. Whereas if I think if you were trying to be like pure, don't worry about what it looks like on television, let's just try and sort of make this sort of fair and reasonable, you'd sort of split up those big robots a little bit more. You wouldn't put Carbide and Eruption and who else was in there? Was it was this where yeah, and um Aftershock and stuff all in the same heat. You'd sort of split them up a bit more, I think. So that's I guess it's not really strictly the the composition format, but it's one of, one of the many things about the televised version of it that I have problems with. <laughs> yeah, that's very much a production choice, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, not not the only one that I uh, that I dislike. It's uh, there's that, and there's also all the uh, all the the fluff in production that we've we've covered to death. So I won't I won't bang on about it now. But I'd I'd like them to do something else with all the dead space between fights. They could. This 10-way thing was amazing. I don't think they should do that every episode, but they could do other things in there, I think. You could highlight other robots that aren't in the competition proper, or you could do like a a 10-way but between like beetle weights or something. I don't know, but I don't know if that's getting a mm. bit too close to some of the craziest stuff in Robot Wars Extreme. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the issue I had with Robot Wars Extreme was the fact that they had to come up with a pretense for everything. I think ditch that, and you've got a very good idea there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even I, I, I don't, I don't know about putting obstacle courses in this, but like a, a little like mini league of 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 ant weight, not ant weights, of like beetle weights, or even ant weights would be quite funny, but beetle weights or something like that, just sort of like highlighting other elements of it would be 
interesting, I think. Well, that is something that was considered for this series. They were provisionally taking applications for featherweights. So maybe that's something we might see. Oh, interesting, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think that's us, isn't it? Uh, you can find the show notes for this episode at spinnerproof.com slash episodes slash 18. And there you can find links to all the things we've been talking about today. You can also find the link to our Twitter at spinnerproof where you can tweet us your favourite Lego set. Good God, we've been recording a long time. <laughs> Bye! <laughs>